This is a warning to all Tesla stock investors. The most accurate projections of Tesla's earnings among retail investors come from Troy. He also beats the Wall Street consensus. And this time he is projecting that Tesla will miss the consensus. He's projecting 80 cents per share, but the consensus from Wall Street is at 82 cents per share. However, even worse is the automotive gross margin prediction, excluding regulatory credits, Troy is projecting only 16.6% versus the 18.2% Wall Street consensus. And I think the automotive gross margins here are a little bit more important than the earnings. So if Troy is right, and if we have bad earnings, the stock may present to us a buying opportunity. However, the second most accurate person who predicts Tesla's earnings is Honey Jam, and he predicts that Tesla will obliterate the earnings expectations and that Tesla will post 95 cents per share, which would be insane. Colin Rush, who is the highest ranking analyst on all of Wall Street, who also analyzes Tesla's stock, says that the reason why Tesla stock is up this week so far is not because of the Cybertruck, it is because investors think that Tesla will pose better than expected gross margins. Here's what he had to say. He starts about the Cybertruck first. They're just delivering on, on one of the promises, albeit um, substantially late compared to, to what they had originally guided. But it just shows incremental progress from the platform. And we think the real driver for the stock here is a little bit of anticipation on Wednesday that they're going to post better than feared gross margins. And we think that's the real number that investors are looking at as they uh, look at the uh, at the results once after the close. In the short to medium term, the gross margin number is quite important. Collins, Julie here. What's going to fuel those better than expected gross margins, do you think, especially considering that they've been in this sort of <clears throat> price cutting mode. Yeah, it's really around the supply chain uh, and, and uh, utilization on the factories. So what we're seeing is supply chain bottlenecks easing up, um, you know, product becoming available, you know, the utilization going up on the factory. And, and this is across the the, the broader OEM complex. And, and so for Tesla, what that means is they've been passing on some of those cost savings. And I think some of the, the fear around the stock has been that margins would be lower for longer. And I think that still persists. But if they show a little bit of progress here off the 17.8%, um, you know, uh, margins x credits from last quarter i think there's going to be uh you know some relief from the bulls and some fear from the the bears that that things are actually getting better and that they can't hit some of the higher end margins that folks are looking at in you know 25 26. if the margins turn out to be lower than expected i don't see it as a problem for two big reasons and really there's a third one as well number one is tesla is going to sell full cell driving so any profits really that tesla makes from vehicles sold that is just a cherry on top, and that's more of an insurance policy for Tesla stock not to drop in the future, but it's not necessarily where most of Tesla's future value is going to come from because FSD is going to be so much bigger. Number two, Tesla has not started advertising seriously yet. We have seen what appeared to be like an ad in one magazine, but if Tesla does a serious advertising campaign, a clever advertising campaign, that will make a huge difference and that would create wait times. And if Tesla did not want to have wait times of, let's say, three months again or longer, maybe even, then Tesla would have to increase prices, which would then push the margins higher up. Advertising is especially effective if you haven't done it before. And I know because I made millions advertising. However, my personal preference is for Tesla to keep lowering prices if needed to stimulate demand and advertise later because that would kill all of the competition. And then once we reach a number of vehicles sold per year that we are satisfied with, then we really focus on margins and then we really advertise. Currently, Colin does not say buy Tesla stock, he says hold Tesla stock. And here he describes what would have to happen for him to change his rating from hold to buy. 
You know, this is, is a, an interesting question with this, uh, the stock. So there's a couple of dynamics that we're looking at pretty closely. First is a gross margin issue that we talked about earlier and their ability to ramp up to you know gross margins in the high 20 percentages on the, on the automotive side and, and the vehicles. The second thing is what their real commentary is around AI. Obviously, the stock ran as uh, a, a lot of the market got enthusiastic around AI for, uh, you know, for broader applications. And the, the under, you know, a number of applications within the Tesla platform, <clears throat> you've got some AI IP, the first one really being self-driving vehicles. Uh, you've got the, this robot that they're talking about uh, building and then the, the Dojo platform that's uh, you know going to drive a, a number of learning cycles and, and faster learning cycles for the company. And so as we uh, look at the stock, you know, the first consideration is really what they're doing on the manufacturing side with the vehicles. And we think they're really having to compete on a, on a performance basis and, and a cost basis with uh, a much broader uh, volume of vehicles as they get to, to higher volumes themselves as a, as a manufacturer, and we're seeing that in the pricing dynamic. But the big question for the stock here, I think, is really what's the realization and, and the reality of AI within this platform? And I think there's a lot of hope built into the stock right now, but not a lot of meat on the bone. And so that's what we're looking for on Wednesday is some commentary around that AI, um, that AI opportunity and how they're going to go about monetizing it. Think carefully about what Colin just said here. He says that there's a lot of hope built into the stock in terms of AI, but there's not a lot of meat on that bone. And yet, he does not say sell Tesla stock. He says hold Tesla stock. In other words, if I'm hearing him right, he can justify the current valuation of Tesla stock mostly basically just with the auto business alone. If I just do some very conservative numbers here, let's say Tesla eventually sells 10 million vehicles per year only, and let's say FSD sells for 10,000 per one vehicle, and because we're only assuming that Tesla is going to sell 10 million vehicles, let's say the take rate of FSD is going to be 100%, although of course that is not going to happen, but also I'm only assuming that FSD would be $10,000. That would produce $100 billion a year in pure profit, basically, and if you'd give out a multiple of 20, that would be $2 trillion added to the market cap of Tesla stock if we oversimplify this whole process. That is just from FSD based on relatively conservative numbers. That alone would triple the stock by adding $2 trillion to the market cap. If we go with more bullish numbers, for example, some of the numbers that Kathy Wood throws out, uh, you could add $10 trillion to Tesla's market cap just from FSD alone, which would more than 10x Tesla stock from where it is today. In other words, you're getting all of that basically for free when you buy Tesla stock today because Tesla's auto business already justifies its present valuation. And if you have been watching my videos a year ago, I've been saying exactly that very much, which is one reason why I don't see Tesla stock as particularly risky. Senator Elizabeth Warren, who CNBC is now reporting, is has sent a letter to the Securities and Exchange Commission um, telling them to investigate Tesla and its board. Certainly, there's a lot of interest around, you know, shareholder protection. Um, you know, broadly speaking, uh, with uh, with consumers, and and certainly when you see stocks as volatile as Tesla, there's a lot of consideration around how those management teams and boards, uh, you know, look after shareholders. You've also seen, you know, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of money made both on the long and short side with uh, with the stock, and there's been, a, you know, like you said, a lot of noise around Elon's behavior and and uh, how the, the stock gets managed um, or the, how the company gets managed. I think that's going to be an ongoing, um, you know, consideration for the SEC, um, you know, for consumer advocates and uh, with Tesla, especially as its influence grows uh, increasingly going forward. Now, that said, what we've seen historically is that Tesla has been very aggressive around defending its position and Elon's been uh, very aggressive about defending his position. And so I don't think um, they'll back down on any of these issues. I personally think that investigation is going to be just noise, although if things go badly, this could present itself as a Tesla stock buying opportunity, but I'm not worried long term because Elon Musk is a fighter and he will not back away from a fight. And now watch someone who loves Ford bash the Ford F-150 Lightning truck. I'm 
not going to bash EVs, but I'm going to go after the Ford F-150. Right. And I race a Ford-powered car. Right. I love Ford. I love the yeah. company. I know people that live next door to the Fords in places like Gross Point. Yeah. Here's the bottom line. Yeah. The Platinum F-150 can cost $90,000. It has an EPA-listed range yeah. of 300 miles, which Motor Trend Magazine says is more like 250. The lower-end one is right. fifty to $60,000. It goes 200 miles on a charge. If you're towing something, yeah. that's 150 miles. What are you going to tow your boat from Detroit to, to <laughs> you know, Walloon Lake in Michigan and stop twice? I don't understand what the industry is trying to do. <laughs> I'm going to throw this out there that the truck buyers historically have been the least amount of change. They do not want change in their pickup truck. It's why their loyalty is so high. It's why the companies are very, very particular in what they change in their trucks. And the EVs, they wanted to beat Tesla. They wanted to beat the Cybertruck. GM wanted to beat them. Ford wanted to beat them. So they got these vehicles out there because that is their bread and butter. And they did not want to lose that market share like they did to all the other EVs like they did to Tesla. And they got these out here. And it's still a very, very unproven market. And we're going to see how this pans out. But today I talked with GM executives and I talked to UAW leaders. And GM says we're monitoring it, we're evaluating it, and we'll see what happens. Sometimes they react, sometimes they don't. But the UAW is also very cautious about well, moving yeah. over to EVs right now. So UAW, which is a union, is careful about moving to EVs. Sounds like they don't want to keep their jobs. Ford somewhat knows that their current offering is not good enough, and therefore they cut the prices especially because the Cybertruck is now coming. They're cutting the price of their uh, F-150 Lightning um, by about 10,000 bucks. What do you think that means for Tesla and what it may have to do with regard to pricing? All of these OEMs are working through what the right price is for the vehicles. And as fuel prices change, you know, from geography to geography, we're seeing oil prices up and down a little bit. We're seeing electricity prices go higher. And with the, the credits that we have in the U.S., it's still about a, a ten dollars to $11,000 total cost of ownership ownership advantage towards EVs. But when you look at kind of some of the base vehicles in the, the trucking market or the, the pickup market, you know, the, the prices need to come down if you're moving away from a luxury sale into a real duty, uh, duty driven sale uh, for folks. And, and so I think the prices on a lot of those trucks are a little bit too high once you get out of the realm of fashion and, and, and luxury. And so Ford, um, you know, although we, we don't cover them, I suspect is, is probably looking at that, uh, that dynamic and saying, you know, what do we need to do from a price perspective to drive volume? and we're seeing some of that today. Ford investors did not expect that and they sold Ford stock. What I'm also hearing is that even though Ford lowered the base price of a Ford Lightning and it now costs about $50,000, which maybe is not all that much, although for what you get, maybe it is a lot. The thing is, you can't buy the base model, I am told. You can't find it even though there's a lot of Ford Lightning inventory just... They don't have the base model because if you are already losing a lot of money for every single vehicle sold, why would you want to sell a version that would lose even more money for you, right? In the U.S. especially, people like to wear their values on the road or show their values on the road. I think people like to look cool in cars. I think this will make them look cool. They like to look cutting edge. And I think there's something as the association with Elon Musk. He's, you know, he's gotten a lot more political uh, in the past few months, the past few years. And I think that's, you know, maybe that's going to have a negative impact on people interested in buying his his, you know, four door cars. But when it comes to a pickup truck, I think that's going to hit. So I, I really do think that this is going to be something that people are going to want to drive. And it's going to it's going to look cool on the road. I think that like it's going to look different. I don't know. I would I would definitely get one if I could park it in New York City. I absolutely cannot wait to test drive a cyber truck. One thing, though, that I'm a little bit worried about is will it fit in my garage? I'm not sure. I could just park it outside, but I would prefer to park it in the garage. Charging would be a lot easier inside the garage instead of outside of the garage. There's a lot of talk about like range anxiety with regard to people who have EVs or considering uh, getting an EV. Um, is the charging network enough for deeper penetration when it comes for or just more market growth when it comes to Tesla and the amount of chargers there are? One, you know, the electrical network is uh, 
widely available across almost the entire country and most developed countries. And so there is potential access for vehicles to be charging at any number of points all along uh, that, that network. Um, two, the, the build out of chargers is still very much in its nascency. And, and there's two elements of this. One, actually installing those chargers, but then two, managing the chargers and the, the impact on the grid. And we think the controls are, are really important here and the potential supplementing of, of batteries. You know, we cover a company called ChargePoint, ticker CHPT, which we're actually quite bullish on given their, you know, leadership from a controls perspective and uh, public charging, uh, particularly in the U.S. And so we think there's still a lot of room to run on this infrastructure build out here through the balance of the decade and into, you know, post-2030. And so at this point, from a range anxiety perspective, I think, uh, you know, folks that actually have vehicles have found ways to, to manage that. And there's there's one, you know, a fair amount of infrastructure available now, so you can kind of solve that problem. The real issue is when you're doing long road trips. And, and so there is, I think, still a fair amount of build out left to happen around those issues. And Tesla certainly is a leader in that regard with its supercharger network. And we're seeing a lot of the OEMs look at what they need to do to enable sales. And, you know, signing up for access to that supercharger network has been, um, you know, a capital efficient way for them to pass on some of those costs to their consumers without actually having to spend the, the cash for that, that infrastructure. If you have an EV and you have range anxiety, it means you probably don't have a Tesla. However, I have a Tesla and occasionally I have inconvenience anxiety if I go on a longer trip. For example, I went on this one trip before and because we had to take a few quick detours, relatively speaking, to charge, we arrived at our destination a little bit later than we expected especially when compared to a gas-powered vehicle that we uh, would have used before. And so we had less time to do fun things once we arrived. It wasn't really a big deal, just an inconvenience, but with more superchargers being built around, especially as more automakers make deals with Tesla and Tesla being forced to open more supercharger locations, we will have to take less detours. And YouTube says you should watch this video next, but if you haven't finished watching this Elon Musk interview, watch this one first. My name is Matt Posius. Like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.